Controlled flight into terrain or CFIT is a phrase coined by Boeing engineers in the 1970s. It is one of the three major accident categories in aviation in which an airworthy aircraft collides with terrain. The distinction being that the aircraft is flyable and fully under control as it hits the ground. A major mechanical problem is rarely pointed to as a causation factor in crashes involving CFIT. Pilot error is usually cited as the major cause. Often, numerous seemingly insignificant elements lead to the crew being unaware of the airplane's position until it is too late. Investigators can generally tell quite quickly if a crash was a result of CFIT by examining the wreckage at a crash site. When in-flight breakup occurs, wreckage is generally spread over a wide expanse, while with CFIT, wreckage is usually contained within a small area. IATA deems CFIT as the second highest risk to aviation safety. Although relatively rare, 91% of CFIT accidents involve fatalities, mostly due to the staggering g-forces inflicted on the plane and its occupants. It can occur in any phase of flight. However, the approach is the most dangerous, with 53% of CFIT accidents occurring during this phase. A textbook yet tragic example of controlled flight into terrain can be seen with Garuda Flight 152. It departed on the morning of the 26th of September 1997. Garuda 152 was a scheduled passenger flight from the capital of Indonesia, Jakarta, to Polonia International Airport in Medan a smaller city in the north of the Southeast Asian country. The aircraft was an Airbus A300 Bravo 4, and at the helm, Captain Ramo Wiogo, along with First Officer Tata Zualdi. They departed with 222 passengers and 12 crew, most of whom Indonesian locals. During the summer of 1997, thick smoke from forest fires significantly reduced visibility over the entire North Sumatra area, including Medan. Weather report information depicted a light and variable wind, visibility reducing to 1,000 metres in smoke haze and scattered cloud. Polonia Airport used to be the major international airport serving Medan. It provided a number of VHF frequencies for communications, and controllers utilised primary and secondary radar. Take the next few minutes to immerse yourself into the crew of Garuda 152. There will be several critical moments, which at the time may seem like minor mistakes or errors. However, in the context of controlled flight into terrain, every seemingly insignificant factor will be examined thoroughly by investigators, in order to establish why the routine flight goes so badly wrong. With the challenging weather conditions, the flight crew expect to be vectored onto an instrument approach for runway 05. They will be using an instrument landing system, or ILS, which allows them to descend to 315 feet solely on instruments. From here, a landing will be continued if the crew make visual contact with the runway through the thick smoke. If not, a go-around or missed approach will be conducted. We join the crew as they make their final preparations for descent. Before descent checklist, crew briefing. Completed. V-bugs. Set. Landing elevation. Set. Strobe lights. On. Shoulder harnesses. Fastened. Before descent checklist complete. Indonesia 152 request descent. Confirm descent to flight level 140. Descend initial 140 Indonesia 152. Indonesia 152, approaching 140. 152, further descent to 3,000 feet. Contact approach 119.7. Down 3,000. Contact approach 119.7. Indonesia 152. Meet and approach Indonesia 152, passing 150. Indonesia 152, radar contact 43 miles. Descend to 3,000 feet for runway 05. Reduce speed to 20. Descend 3,000 for runway 5. Reduce speed to 220 knots. Indonesia 152. What? 05? Uh, approach 152. Request reason to reduce speed above 10,000 to 220 knots. Okay, sir. Traffic for departure, sir. 
Now starting engine. Release traffic for departure at or before 27. 152 would like to maintain 210 knots, 250 knots below 10,000 feet. Okay, approved. The crew are expecting to be vectored overhead the aerodrome and to make a left-hand pattern to intercept the ILS for runway 05 from the left-hand side. Adding to the controller's workload is an aircraft preparing to depart from the opposite direction, runway 23. He'll need to position 152 to allow time and space for the departing traffic. Soon to be heard on frequency is a third airliner, which is about to join the ILS onto runway 05. It is number one to the departing traffic. Landing initial checklist. Before landing initial checklist. Seatbelt, no smoking. On, on. Ignition. Concrete light. Fuel feed. Check. Feeding automatic. Check. Calvin altitude. Check. Descending. Check. Altimeter. 1010. Set. DHMDA 312. Air. Exterior light. Set. Merpati 214, passing 10,000. Merpati 214, we have your position now 11 miles on Whiskey 11. Contact 121.2. Happy land. 121.2, good afternoon, thank you. It's smoky here below 10,000. Yes. Okay, passing Mora. Sector radar vector, yeah? Yes, correct. Indonesia 152, 3000. Indonesia 152, maintain 3000 feet for a while. Maintain heading, meet in VOR. Traffic now still taxiing, runway 23. Maintain 3000, Indonesia 152. We go overhead first, Captain. Perhaps. Her body, one five two. Number one Turn left on heading behind to help me do the approach. Two four yeah. zero, vectoring for intercept ILS zero five from the right side. Traffic now about rolling. Indonesia one five two. Do you read? Indonesia one five two. Say again. Okay. Turn left heading two four zero, two three five. Vectoring for intercept ILS runway 05. Roger. Left heading 235. Indonesia 152. Why so far? Slots extend. Speed check. 152 heading 235. Are we clear from the uh, mountainous area? Affirm, sir. Continue left on heading 215. On heading 215, Indonesia 152. Good afternoon, approach. Burak 683, departure, left turn. Just passed it. Burak 683, continue left turn, heading 120, initial 2,000 feet. Indonesia 152, traffic clear. Descend to 2,000 feet. Descend 2,000 feet. Indonesia 152. Indonesia 152, turn right heading 046. Report establish localizer. Turning right heading 040. Indonesia 152, check established. We are now in the most critical phase of the flight, the approach, made all the more perilous with the dense smoke obscuring the sky. 152 is now cleared to join the ILS, which will direct them down to the runway. The captain controls the autopilot, while the first officer has his head down. Reconfiguring the airplane in preparation for landing. Flaps 8. Speed check. Flaps 8. It's moving. 1. 7. It is hot. Yeah. Please have a look at that. The cockpit is very hot. For right. Indonesia 152. Confirm turning left or turning right. Heading 046. Turning right, sir. Roger, 152. 152, confirm you are making a left turn now. We are turning right now. 152, okay, continue left turn now. Uh, confirm turning left? We're starting to turn right now? Uh, duh. Okay, okay. Just turn right. Please be back to me. No, 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 later. Yeah. 
descend. Pull up! Pull up! All 222 passengers and 12 crew are killed as Garuda 152 comes to rest in an abandoned rice field to the west of Medan. The impact area is fairly small, with the largest parts of the airplane still being recognisable. However, the G-forces experienced in the crash confirmed that it was not survivable in any part of the aircraft. The accident of Garuda 152 was quickly classified into the controlled flight into terrain category. We can pinpoint the moment that the aircraft was put into an undesired aircraft state. While a right turn was instructed by ATC, the captain erroneously commanded the autopilot to turn left. The first officer was heads down at this moment, as he extended and monitored the flaps, and reset the air conditioning system. What was key to the investigation, however, is what led to the captain's mental model of being adamant that he had to turn left. And how did this relatively benign undesired aircraft state snowball into a classic example of controlled flight into terrain? Kicking off the chain of confusion was the air traffic controller making an error in his initial vectoring of Garuda 152. As the controller used an incorrect call sign, both pilots were engaged in a conversation about the engines, meaning they both completely missed information regarding their vectors to join the ILS. When the controller repeated the message, he leaves out the pertinent information that 152 would be intercepting the ILS from the right hand side. It appears that Captain Wiyogo built up a dangerous level of confirmation bias in the lead up to the accident. Common practice at Polonia Airport was to vector aircraft for a right hand pattern to join the ILS for runway 05, however the flight crew were almost solely referencing their Jeppesen charts which showed a procedure where aircraft would overfly the aerodrome and make a left-hand pattern. The captain made numerous statements indicating that he fully expected to join the ILS from the left-hand side, and an exchange with his FO shows that both pilots shared this expectation. By the time the incorrect turn was made, the captain's mental model had developed to the point that he was adamant that he had already flown over the aerodrome, and was being vectored to join the ILS from the left-hand side. His brain simply did not process any countering information. While the first officer did have better awareness of the aircraft's position, he was heads down when the left turn was initiated. It wasn't until the aircraft was well established in the turn that he was able to notice the error. The role of the air traffic controller at Polonia was also put into question. Radar was available to the controller, however he seemed to have a challenging time monitoring the path of Garuda 152 especially as it manoeuvred in the final stages of the flight. ICAO state that 4 to 6 second radar return intervals should be provided for controllers manning the approach sector. Speeds slower than this are inadequate to monitor the subtle lateral movements of aircraft during the approach. The investigation of Garuda 152 uncovered that the radar rotational speed at Polonia was set at just 5 RPM, providing a return every 12 seconds. This is enough time for an airliner to make a rate 1 18 degree turn, a concerningly large margin of error considering the critical phase of flight. Communication between the controller and pilots seemed to only lower the level of awareness. Just one example of this comes as the controller initially questioned the actions of the crew. The phrase, turning right now, could be interpreted two ways. The intention of the captain was to state that he was in fact turning back to the right. However, the controller interpreted this as the aircraft currently being in a turn. Confusion only grew further in the following exchanges. The controller was taken by surprise when he discovered that 152 was in fact turning right, exclaiming, Ada being an Indonesian expression reflecting shock or surprise. However, a whole 20 seconds passed before any corrective instructions were provided, and no emergency language was used at any point. But why was Garuda 152 allowed by the pilots to descend so low in the first place? Their assigned altitude from ATC was 2,000 feet, a height which would have kept the flight safe, despite deviating outside of the localizer footprint momentarily. The autopilot would be expected to capture this level, even if both pilots were distracted at the time. It was never discovered why the aircraft descended through 2,000 feet. However, the official accident report sets out three possible scenarios. The pilot entered VS mode with an altitude higher than 3,000 feet selected. The pilot set a lower altitude than 2,000 feet in the altitude window. Or the autopilot system malfunctioned.
Airbus states that the probability of an autopilot malfunction in this scenario is lower than 4.67 times 10 to the negative 10. Though the following is complete speculation, the altitude knob in the Airbus A300 has been described as extremely sensitive. An inadvertent misset of 1,000 feet can happen occasionally when releasing the knob. This may have led to 2,000 feet being appropriately selected in the altitude window. However, when the knob was released, selection was reduced by a further 1,000 feet. The aircraft would then be allowed to descend unrestricted through the safe altitude of 2,000 feet, with both pilots simply unaware, distracted by their incorrect lateral course and confusion surrounding instructions from air traffic control. The disastrous fate would now be sealed. There is one last line of defence provided to airliners against controlled flight into terrain. Ground Proximity Warning System, or GPWS, is installed in airliners to alert pilots if the aircraft is in immediate danger when flying towards the ground or an obstacle. GPWS was installed on the aircraft for Garuda 152. Investigators uncovered that it should have provided at least one warning to the crew. However, the cockpit voice recorder did not reveal any such alert. GPWS systems were checked just once a year at Garuda, at aircraft sea checks. Thus a great deal of time was allowed to pass for potential faults to develop. One of the recommendations investigators included in their final report was more regular checks of GPWS systems, given their critical role in acting as a final line of defence in CFID accidents. In modern times, there is significant emphasis on preventing causation factors which lead to CFID accidents. However, GPWS and the more modern Terrain Awareness Warning System continue to play a crucial role in acting as the last line of defence. Parallel to this is the effective implementation of these systems through thorough maintenance of the device itself, as well as solid training for pilots, allowing a quick and effective response to a GPWS event. GPWS and TORS have and will continue to save lives and are the final barrier to preventing any further disasters like Garuda 152. Between 2010 and 2014, there were just 0.08 CFIT accidents per million flights in the US, and zero in Europe. CFIT accident risks are several degrees higher though in regions where GPWS and TORS are not required by aviation regulators. In their report, IATA strongly recommends that these regions begin mandating the use of GPWS and TORS, given their strong association with CFIT mitigation. The accident of Garuda 152 is still the worst accident in Indonesia's history. Polonia Airport closed in 2013, making way for the larger Kuala Namu International Airport to the east of Medan. The rise of modern day technologies like GPWS and TORS make it extremely unlikely that disasters this substantial will ever happen again. It is a prime example of advanced technology being introduced into the aviation sector, along with good integration with existing systems. GPWS and TORS vastly decrease the risk of fatal accidents, thus contributing to the extraordinary safety record which we see in aviation today.